You're listening to the Unsiloed Podcast with Greg LeBlanc, produced by University FM. Unsiloed is a series of interdisciplinary conversations that inspire new ways of thinking about our world. So wherever you are, enjoy today's episode, and here's your host, Greg LeBlanc. Welcome to Unsiloed. This is Greg LeBlanc, and I'm here today with Albert Laszlo Barabasi. Or is it Barabasi? I have, my Hungarian is... Uh, if you want the true Hungarian way, it's Barabasi. Uh, Barabasi, yes. And you are at the uh, Network Studies Institute, is that correct, at Northeastern University? I think you, you're mentioned as a professor of network science. And I guess there's not a lot of professors of network science out there because it's usually not a department. Yes, but I'm proudly so... There are a department, the Central European University has a department of network and data science, and I'm a visiting professor there as well. But within Northeastern, my official title is whatever, Dutch professor of network science. And I proudly wear that title. And also the author of a couple of books. This book, Linked, came out more than 20 years ago, The New Science of Networks. I think if you re-released it, you'd have to scratch out the word new because it's now pretty pervasive. And then there's this book called Bursts, A Hidden Pattern Behind Everything We Do, which is a bit about power laws, a bit about Brownian motion, about levy flights and sort of quantitative analysis of a lot of different aspects of human behavior and animal behavior, but also this most recent book, which is called The Formula, The Universal Laws of Success. And so I guess, I mean, the first question I'd have for you is, is it inevitable that anybody who studies behavior is ultimately going to be drawn to writing a book? I mean, you don't call it a self-help book, but you call it kind of a science help book. I mean, in business schools, we combine the positive and the normative. We describe how the world works. And then we, of course, want to tell people, okay, now here's what you can do with it. And I think the formula is really all about how do you, if you understand how networks work, and if you understand the science of what you've been doing for most of your career, then inevitably you're going to want to put it to use. And so is that sort of a trajectory that you knew you were going to head? I mean, have you always had in the back of your mind that there are these useful insights that you can glean from this research? Yes and no. In a sense that there is an evolution. And let's just talk about the evolution. When I wrote Linked, I was really convinced that I'm writing it for like 500 graduate students. And to the degree that really I was very surprised myself when it became the business book of the year, a book that really doesn't talk about business, right? <laughs> and so I was really shocked by the wide reception, like it's been translated over 30 languages. I couldn't really believe it. And there are hundreds of thousands of copies in and is still selling in a way. As you said, it's the new science of network back 20 years ago, but it's still kind of Whatever we say is still valid uh, there. The laws that I describe are valid. And one of the things I learned from Linked is that, yes, everything that's in Linked is already in research papers that we and others have published. And so is the content of my other two books. But people who lead Linked and people who lead the formula, they don't read our research papers and the other way around. People who read our research papers are not so much into general audience books. So it is really talking to very, very different audience by kind of deciding to write a coherent story. So that was number one. Number two, both Linked and the formula were driven by a deep desire to really share these things. Because then, particularly when I was writing Linked, and to something even we were working on the research behind the formula as well, I was realizing that here we're actually capturing some fundamental truth about the world, about nature, about society. And we are seeing that science is forcing us on a perspective that does not exist or did not exist up to that moment. And it was just in there that you need to bring it out and put it in a context that is accessible to a bigger group of people than those who are actually kind of in the particular field. And if I want to be also selfish, it helps me to understand what I'm doing by writing about it. So it's also to kind of organize my thought and kind of feel like kind of get a bigger perspective about where we are and where could we go with this. Now, back in 2002, I mean, this is before social networks. This is before cell phone data was widely available. I mean, we now have so much data on human behavior because we track everything. I mean, the discipline has exploded, but I mean, has all this additional data merely 
kind of confirmed what we already knew or has it sort of led to new discoveries in network science? Both. I mean, it certainly gave us lots of opportunity to ask questions that we could not ask up to that moment. But what's kind of remarkable about LinkedIn, even myself and I go back to it, is that what we had there is still solid. We just know more. And furthermore, this is what happens when the field is being born. In the first few years, you really cover the big teams almost immediately. And this is not to say there are no big teams coming after that. But when you look at the structure of the link, it still kind of defined the structure of network science as we look at it today, right? And this is not my genius. This is the community's genius that we were simply in the first two, three years We asked all those questions that will actually define the canon for many years to come. Now, that being said, of course, with time, the questions have shifted. I do talk a little bit about community finding. Community finding became a very big discipline, right, within network science so and social networks and so on. So that's one area. If you look today of what network scientists are doing, they're taking these ideas to many areas that we were not there before, like medicine, right? Even though I talk about network biology, I don't talk about network medicine. Now, network medicine is very hot. And social scientists are now using networks to look at disinformation and fake news and so on. So the accents and the questions have shifted but that didn't invalidate those early questions and the answers we find to them. So that's why I think it's still amazing how many people are continuing to read LinkedIn. For many people, this is still the starting point to learn about networks who those have not been initiated with that. And I want to say that it has not been kind of, let's put it this way, it has aged well. Well, I mean, the difference between studying humans and studying non-humans is that when we learn about these underlying rules and principles, we can change our behavior to take advantage of them, right? So to the extent that we've been learning a lot about networks, and I guess to the extent that there are going to be people that are going to read your book, is that going to sort of create a feedback loop that leads to the phenomena itself changing? I mean, I'm in the world of finance, and when the Black-Scholes theorem was created, the behavior actually began to resemble the model. So there was this kind of feedback mechanism. And and of course, your fellow Hungarian, George Soros, has written about this quite a bit in financial markets. So, I mean, will the phenomenon that we study change over time as we kind of learn how to leverage these principles that you articulate in success? So this is a double-edged question, right? Because on one end, I want to think that we do incorporate in our behavior these lessons that we learn from the data, Right. And I certainly do, right? And I certainly think network-like and I advise people network-like and I do what I preach, right? (laughs) So in a sense that it certainly kind of helped me to give a perspective and make decisions in a much faster way because I know the basics. That being said, is that big enough to fundamentally change the behavior or rather now having the framework we recognize And I think it's the second. So it's not much that people read the formula or read the link and then they start doing things according to the laws, but rather you start seeing the laws in action in a way that you did not see that before. And there is actually evidence, numerical evidence for that, uh, of this feedback loop. There has been lots of discussion about 15 years ago whether the Google ranking actually changes the visibility of the pages. And finally, Alex Vespignani and others from Indiana University have offered evidence that it does not. <laughs> right. So, yes, of course, Google does kind of rank things up. And obviously, if you're ranked top, you're going to get higher uh, visibility. But there is no quantitative evidence that distorts the world wide. But for no other reason is that Google is responding to so many diverse searches and they go in so many different directions that these are all put in different perspective and in the end, they just unroll themselves. Fundamentally, the data indicates there is no feedback loop. Now, you define this new science of success, and maybe that'll be the next department. <laughs> we'll have, after the network science, we'll have a success science departments. Although I think 
business schools think of themselves as being schools for success. But you said that when you started thinking about this, you originally were thinking about it in the context of failure or disasters. And I guess these two are complementary. I mean, is it possible to study science success without also studying failure? Well, a failure is part of success. And my former student, Da Shun Wang, actually has done a wonderful job of kind of looking at it from the data perspective. But I, I know what you are referring to, right? For us, for me, the study of science success started out with a failure, but not with the scope of studying failure. It started out by having a project with Da Shun and Jim Bagger of Postdoc in my lab that we looked at disasters. And we had a gorgeous paper where we use mobile phone data to understand how people respond to a disaster that happens in their neighborhood. Given that mobile phone is really a sensitive measurement, you can see who's calling when a bomb goes off uh, and how people react to that drastic event, for example. And despite the fact that we thought we had a cool paper and we did, we know in the hindsight we had a very influential paper, there was lots of follow up in that. We had a hell of a time getting that paper published. We were rejected journal after journal with that. And so it was one of those kind of late night discussion with Deshun, who kind of was a student on the project to say, what are you going to do next? And then he said, whatever it is, I don't want another disaster. <laughs> and, we had, and we started laughing and I said, okay, well, no disaster. How about success? And let's study success. And we kind of had it like it's a joke. But then we looked at each other and I said, hmm, actually, this is an interesting question. We could study success. And at that moment, we perceived it as exploring success as a network science question. We were under the impression that the big data sets that started to just emerge at that time about scientific publication patterns and so on, the net collaboration network between the scientists and so on, would allow us to quantify the question of at least within science success. So we started that process and eventually we soon learned that yes, networks are part of the story, but not the only piece of the story. And then we had to expand the whole scope of investigation. And hence the study of success didn't become just a chapter of network science, but it ended up taking a life of its own. Now, you make a distinction between performance and success in the book. And I think a lot of people think that performance will naturally lead to success. I don't know whether it's a certain disposition or ideology. It may be something that is probably more common in America than any other part of the world. Because in America, we have this idea that if you build a better mousetrap, people will beat a path to your door, right? And that sort of summarizes this idea that the quality of your work or some objective measure of your merit is ultimately going to prevail in equilibrium. And I think financial economists tend to think this. We have efficient markets. If a company has a value, it, it'll be reflected in the price, you know, and there's only these minor temporary deviations that are due to perceptions and subjectivity and information diffusion and so forth. So, I mean, is that... Where did we ever get this notion <laughs> that, that these things were somehow coextensive? So it's a very good point. And listen, the education system is fundamentally based on the idea that performance leads to success. You're told to study because you're going to be a better, whatever, a doctor, scientist, whatever, and, and hence you will be successful in your profession of choice. The, the sports are based on the idea. You go and exercise, you go and practice because that will make you better. And if you are better, you're going to be better at that sports, what you do. And this is something that I don't want to deny it because you do need kind of performance to achieve success. But one of the points I make early on in the formula is there is a fundamental distinction between the two because performance is really about you and your success is about us. And what do I mean by that? Is that if we look very carefully, everything that is performance is really typically individual, uh, links to individual qualities, that how fast can you run, how good of a research paper can you write, how good of a speaker you are, and so on and so forth. However, every measure of success is really given by the community whether that's feedback, whether that's acknowledgement, whether that's adoration, whether that's money, whether that's like, it's always a communal measure. It's you don't pay yourself, you don't like yourself, or you could do that, right? But not at the scale that really leads to success. 
And it's really the community provides that to you. So therefore, if you want to understand success, we at the beginning, we do need to kind of distinguish these two things. That And you need to ask yourself, how do you measure performance? And how do you measure success? And when and how is the relationship between them? And so there's going to be some circumstances where performance is easy to measure. And presumably when it's easier to measure, it's more likely to lead to success. Obviously. And sports is kind of my go-to example in that case. The faster you run, the more famous you are as a runner. And there's a one-to-one relationship between uh, performance and success in most individual sports, from running to tennis and so on. And indeed, we can explicitly measure it because we have performance measures and we have all the different type of measures of success from money to prizes to number of people liking your Wikipedia page and so on. And there's a beautiful correlation between the two. However, the question comes, how do you measure the performance of a university professor? How do you measure the performance of a podcast host? And how do you measure the performance of a doctor? And the problem with this is that performance is not a one-dimensional quantity. There's so many dimensions of performance when it comes to teaching, when it comes to having a podcast, when it comes to curing people. And hence, it becomes virtually unmeasurable. Yet, success is not unmeasurable. So in most of us, the vast majority of humanity lives, works in professions where there is not an objective measure of performance, but they're very clear measures of success. And so really the formula is about, all of the formula is really about how and when do these things connect. And I want to emphasize from the very beginning that this book and the world science behind it is not about how do you make an unsuccessful or a low performance individual successful. If you got that book for that reason, you're reading it for the wrong reason, right? The real problem is this. And kind of the data backs that one to some degree up. So when you don't have an objective measure of performance, that doesn't mean that you cannot distinguish weak people from strong people. You can easily do that. You know who is a strong doctor. You know who is a good teacher in general. When you put two individuals next to each other in those areas, it's almost impossible to say who is better, who is a better teacher. This is, again, it's easy to say bad from good, but good from good is virtually impossible to distinguish. Yet, we pick one and we make a superstar and we ignore the rest. So the real question comes, and this is really the topic of the formula, how do we do that? And what are the mechanisms and why do we do that? What are the mechanisms that really forces us that even the, in spaces where we cannot distinguish performance, we decide to have a winner and who is going to be that winner. But the extent to which we can measure performance, I mean, this is not exogenous. You can invest in performance metrics. I'm thinking, you know, within an organization, I did a whole course on HR analytics. And, and the idea was you can move for certain professions, certain occupations, certain types of employees You can design metrics. You can start to track things that you didn't track before and then start to move things from a world where you couldn't measure performance to one where you could. And so that's presumably endogenous, right? It's a function of how much you're willing to invest in the design of these performance metrics. You could do that, right? And you will measure what you are setting up to measure. But is that really what matters from an organizational perspective? That's the real question, right? And often we become the slaves of metrics. That is, the metrics becomes the goal because we... Number of papers published. Yes, because we can measure it, because it's available, because it's accessible. And hence, we try to opti- start optimizing for that and forgetting the real reason why that organization is there. And that's where I'm a little skeptic that, yes, of course, I'm I'm a person who develops lots of metrics, at least for networks. So don't get me wrong. I'm very much in favor of the metrics, but then comes how do you interpret the metrics, right? And how do you use them? And when you have a multidimensional success measure or performance measure in both of them, then the question is, which one do you emphasize and which one you're going to measure? And the answer is very simple. You always measure what you can, but that may not be the one you need, (laughs) So I always kind of suggest, let's go step and take a step back and understand the underlying forces that really distinguish performance and success. And let's just talk for a second, what are those? 
And one of them is, I call the second law in the book, that performance is bounded and success is unbounded. What do we mean by that? Well, every time we can measure performance, turns out that it really moves in a very narrow range, which is to say Usain Bolt used to be the fastest person on earth, but he wasn't running a hundred or thousand times faster than I do. And I'm not a good runner at all, right? And he runs less than 10 times faster than I do. And he wins the competition by running less than 1% faster than the number two. And what is true for running, which means that the really this runner speeds are in a very, very narrow range, if you look at it numerically, is true for most performance that we can measure at that, that typically there's a very narrow variation of performance. Now, this is not a problem if you have a chronometer, but if you don't have a chronometer and you cannot distinguish a 0.1 second difference, then who, who do you decide who's the best? And even in sports, we fail. And I think the example that I bring in the book is something comes close. I think the Brazil Olympics in swimming, and I think in 100 meter, there were three first prizes, that including one of the Hungarian swimmers, as well as Phelps from the US. And the third one had to share the whatever prize they all got, be, not because they didn't know who arrived first. They knew exactly, there was a video recording who touched the the right line first, but because there was a two and a half centimeter uncertainty about the size of the swimming pool and the distance, the time difference was less than you'd need to swim the two and a half centimeters. So they could, it was a statistically indistinguishable who is the winner in this particular case. So when we get to sports where you have a thousand cameras looking and taking a photo of who is touching that first, right? And we cannot distinguish who is the best, how are we gonna find who is the best podcast host, right? So this is what I say, performance is bounded. Every time we can measure it most in a very narrow range. There are, some are better than the other one, but the variability is not huge. And again, easy to say good from bad, not easy to say good from good. Success, however, is unbounded. And what do I mean by that? And the best example that I often use is also kind of comes from my own life. When my previous book, Burst, appeared, I was in New York talking to my editor. And I said, let's see who is the competition, right? Who is on the New York Times bestseller list? Who do we have to beat? And I think it was Nicholas Sparks' latest book that just came out the same week that my book. Yeah, you're not going to beat him. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, you, you always dream about it. And what was odd about it is that he sold more than 100,000 copies that week. And you can get to the New York Times bestseller list by selling three to 10,000 copies. And typically with the 10,000 number, you are number one. And with 200,000, he was still number two. So how is that possible? Because the same week came out the Dan Brown's latest book. I don't remember the title now, but what matters is that book sold 1.2 million books that week. So when we talk about performance bounded, is that how much better writer is Dan Browns than Sparks? Let's not debate that. <laughs> but it's certainly not a fivefold and not that the differences are orders of magnitude bigger when it comes to the success measure. And the reason they can be is because Performance is something that you can do, and that can be only limited of how much you change. But success is a collective thing. We all buy the book. We all listen to your podcast. And hence, without extra effort, you can get huge increase in your success measures. So then the big question is really, if success is unbounded and performance is bounded, how do we pick the winner and how do we give it so much success, right? When we are aware of the fact that we are really unable to see who's better. Well, I mean, this idea of winner take all, I mean, the degree to which we, we see this concentration, that does change over time. I mean, for certain reasons related to technology, it would be impossible for a pianist to be a successful in the 19th century. I mean, you've got lists. I mean, lists can only go to so many concert halls. There were no CDs, there was no streaming. But I remember in the 90s when Netflix and Amazon and all these companies started out, there was this notion of the long tail. And everyone thought, oh, wow, this is great. We're going to see a flattening of the distribution and all these weird exotic preferences are going to finally see the light of day. And, you know, it won't be the Beatles and everybody else. It'll be lots and lots of stuff. And what we saw was that we actually 
got much more concentrated. Dan Brown and J.K. Rowling and, you know, those sorts of things. And I mean, did that surprise you or was that sort of something that you would have predicted back in? Well, I mean, I wrote my first book linked about preferential attachment and the emergence of power laws in the context of networks. And that still is my claim to fame professionally as well. Of why do we have the Googles and the Amazons and the highly connected websites out there? And why do they have such an exceptional number of links? And it turns out, yes, it's partially to the services what they provide, which we consider fitness, but it's also an intrinsic property of the networks that the rich gets richer, which we mathematically express is preferential attachment, that the likelihood that you get new links or new whatever is proportional to how much you do have. So it's not surprising. The question is really that how is this really seen in action? And given that, when does performance matter? in this case. And one of the kind of points I make in the book is that yes, performance does drive success. And those who get this exceptional reward are typically do deserve it, right? So this is not again to say a recipe for how you make something successful that doesn't have the performance. But when the performance is hard to measure, the network takes over and that's what drives success. That is, if you're not aware of the performance or you you cannot distinguish, something's still going to win, and that will not be any longer dependent on the performance, but will be a network effect. And that's where really networks come in. And there's over and over many experiments that I discuss in the book of how it's totally unpredictable in some cases of who among the potential winners will be the winner. This is not to say that one cannot influence it. And that is said that there are no mechanisms we don't we that that kind of drives what is that going to be and this is really what the book is about is those mechanisms, but fundamentally, when performance is not measurable, then it becomes a network phenomenon. But I mean, the extent to which preferential attachment is a factor. I mean, it's a function of the size of the network. It's a function of the observability and the sequentiality. So I remember this was. It may have been back in the 90s, there was a professor at Harvard Business School who had written some book and he wanted to make it into a bestseller. So I forget, I don't know if it's apocryphal, I haven't seen any validation of this, but he realized that the New York Times, when they determined what the bestsellers were, is that there were these two distribution warehouses, one in New York and one in LA, and that was their sample. And so he said, I'm going to go into some Barnes and Noble in New York and buy a hundred copies of my book. And we go to LA and buy a hundred copies of my book. This got him up onto the you know, number eight and then boom, from there on in, <laughs> you know, it was a bestseller. Now, I don't think it was a terrible book, but there were probably a dozen books that had the same basic set of bullet points. Now, of course, the sampling method is a little more complicated, but it's clear that if you want to jumpstart preferential attachment, there are now these widely understood ways to make it happen, right? Yes, and that's the point. So I think it's, there's no reason to debate whether preferential attachment is there. We have seen so much evidence across many systems, and it's very measurable, right? So it's not just a qualitative statement we make, but in systems where we have enough data, you can explicitly measure the magnitude of preferential attachment, right? So then the big question becomes, how do you jumpstart it? And then actually in the under the third law, I do talk about a series of experiments that social scientists have done to explicitly modulate preferential attachment. And you know, using Kickstarter and other platforms where doing simple things as just going and giving the first donation for a project turns out could actually kind of amplify the project significantly. And this is one of the take-home messages that really kind of comes from this book, is if you understand the forces that act on how success emerges, then you can actually start thinking about that in the domain where I am, what really matters and where do I put my focus? And this is, I always never think of these roles as saying, how do I manipulate the system? Because you can't manipulate these systems. What you can do is that where do you put your efforts? And that's the way I use this. So let me give the ex- one example, right? Is networking is so important. So that, and even I say in the book that when performance is unmeasurable, networks determine success. So should we just spend our time going and meeting more and more people and kind of be 
as much of a hub in as many networks as possible? And the answer is not, because you need to understand for the type of phenomena, the type of performance that you are after in success, what is the network that matters? Because each area has a different network. If you're an artist, if you're a scientist, if you're in the business world, you're dealing with fundamentally different processes and different type of networks. So you need to understand on one end, what are the networks that really drive that process? And you also need to understand what are your entry points, that what are the points in that network that you can have influence on, because much of the network is doing its own thing and you have zero influence over it. And when can you influence that? And that's where I think that, at least in my life, this is where these laws are very, very important, is that I often tell to people that there are about five laws in this book. And... Yes, they do all apply to you. If you are in that stage of your life, that matters for you. (laughs) They're kind of unavoidable in the sense that that, uh, these are kind of distilled from lots of data by us and many others. So there's lots of evidence like preferential attachment, but you may not be in the particular professional area where this one or the other may apply to you, but one of them will certainly do. So the challenge you have is that you have this menu of understanding where is your performance who needs to acknowledge your performance to be observed, right? What are the networks that really matter and where your entry points are in that network so that you can influence that? And once again, influencing is not about changing the network, but about the network recognizing your performance. And this is the key, really. This is kind of the distinction between performance and success because success is a collective measure. We give success to you, so you need to come to us and make sure that we understand what you do. We can compare it to others who do different th- similar things, and ultimately we can acknowledge you and reward you for that. And this is a collective phenomenon, and you have to work with the community. It's not a lonely journey any longer. Now, you shied away from using this word manipulate, but, I mean, obviously these things can be used as manipulation. And in fact, if you're designing a good system or a good marketplace or mechanism, you want to impose rules, right? So you talk about sock puppeting. I know some folks that have reviewed their own books or shill bidding. We try to ban shill bidding. Or if you're trying to come up with some collective decision, like with a jury or a panel, there are rules where you might want to have everybody write down their opinion simultaneously rather than have somebody come out with their opinion and then have everybody else observe it. So, I mean, part of what you're describing with respect to the rules for success can also be used by people who are trying to design institutions, marketplaces, and so forth to divert people's investment in a direction that might be more towards the performance and less towards engaging in network activities. I certainly hope that people do that. And if they don't do it, then that's kind of their problem, right? Because they're not taking into consideration what is the architecture that drives human behavior so that you can design the system that it's the most beneficial for the goal you have. But the way I think about it, this is not necessarily manipulation. When you built an airplane or the rocket, are you manipulating gravity? No, you learn how to fly. And I tend to think that these forces are bigger than us, and hence we cannot manipulate. And the question is, can you build your airplane? Yeah, no, I completely get that. But the rules are, to some extent, endogenous. Look, you did a lot of work on team dynamics also, and team success. And I love your example, the kind of blue. And you also referenced the egg-laying hens. That's one of my favorite (laughs) studies. I think I remember I saw this at an animal behavior conference, and the idea is that if you take a whole bunch of very productive hens and you put them together, you wind up with a very unproductive group of hens. And so, I mean, when it comes to team activity, how do we try to disentangle individual performance? And how is it that if you are part of a successful team, you can somehow get the kind of credit that you would hope to get as part of that team? And here you put your finger on that, right? So there's one thing which which is the team dynamics, right? Is that how teams work. And there is, by now, there is really a big body of research on that that I'm sure some of you have reviewed actually on your podcast. And that's a science of its own. 
But I personally find it very fascinating, and this book is really a little bit about that, is to say, okay, you and I and 20 others are in part of a team that has achieved something great. Now, who is going to walk away with the credit? And the question is, you would say, why would I even ask that? Well, because someone will. Because we don't know how to credit teams. We always know how to credit individuals. So sooner or later, we're going to pick you and say, you get all the benefits from the team succeeding. And this is a very important phenomenon in all areas, including science, that I kind of always tell my students and postdocs when we publish a great paper somewhere in a big journal, right? And then after we publish it, I sit down and I say, okay, congratulations. Now, here's something that you need to know. We published this Greek paper, and this is my paper, not yours. And the reason why it's my paper is because I'm an established scientist. And when people open up the journal, they say, oh, Barabashi published yet another paper. Whether I like it or not, it's there. And they don't know you. And the question is, how are you going to convince the community that first, you exist, and second, that the credit should go to you? And there are mechanisms how credit is really assigned. And we have actually, my lab researched it to the degree that we were able to write an algorithm. And for research people, we can design, we can very quickly tell who among the authors will get the credit. And it doesn't matter whether it's the first or the last or the middle author. And we can predict based on the paper that can have 175 authors, who is going to get the Nobel Prize for that? And how do we do that? Well, we do that by looking at which author's papers are co-cited with the big discovery. Because we want to know whose intellectual journey is that discovery is part of. So if you and I publish now a paper on network science, Greg, I'm sorry to say, it's going to be my paper. Because I have so many other papers in network science, and it's part of my journey. Well, if we publish something on science, or let's say that this podcast will be hugely successful, they redefine the whole podcast universe. It's going to be your podcast, and it's going to be your credit, not mine, because you have a track in doing podcast, actually, and it's part of that particular system. So it's very essential that every time you're part of a team dynamics to understand that if that project succeeds, someone will get a credit. Now, the credit may not matter. I participate in many, many projects where I just want the project done, and I honestly don't care who's going to get the credit for it. But if you are in a situation that you are there for your credit, you're building your career, then you need to start paying attention to that. And what I talk actually in the fourth law, right, is that the single individual will receive all the credit for the group's achievement. I talk about the mechanisms, how credit is assigned, and what is that you need to do after that work is achieved, that discovery is being made or whatever, to change that if you want. And I have seen many examples that I discuss in my group as well, where credit assignment can change, but this will never happen by itself. It's always a laborious process that you have to be part of. But if you care about the credit, you have to do that. Either you have to choose projects where if it succeeds, you will get the credit because it's part of your journey. Or if it's not part of your journey, you have to make it part of your journey. Now, academics in training don't really get exposed to this. I mean, in business school, we spend a lot of time telling people how to craft their career, how to make sure they get credit for what they do at work, how to leverage networks and so forth. In the sciences and in academia, if you have a really good mentor, you might learn this, but you generally don't get taught it. I mean, there isn't a class. You come into your PhD program and say, okay, we're going to give you a class on how to become a successful and recognized academic. <laughs> Should we offer this as a class? I mean, some would argue it's a zero-sum game. So, you know, if you're giving one person the tools for success, you're necessarily just squeezing somebody out. I mean, would the scientific community benefit if the practitioners were more savvy about how to gain recognition? I don't think this is a zero-sum game, by the way. Because if you put the right people at the right place, then the sum increases. 
And it stays a zero sum game if you consider it like that. So I think both in academia and in business in any other area, our interest should be that the right people should be in the right position, right? And here I'm not saying those who deserve to be there, but the right people in the right position. And yes, you're right that in academia, we don't train. We're very shy of talking about these processes. And we still kind of approach the academic career as performance matters and only performance matters. But on the other hand, to achieve the performance in academia, there's so many processes that involve kind of understanding how you succeed in this process. Like when I came to America to do my PhD, I had no idea what the difference between Boston University and Harvard or MIT. I had zero understanding of that. I came to Boston University because there's a very famous professor, Gene Stanley, who was there, whose papers I knew, and he was the only place I applied to, right? And so my example is a good example that there's so many things that we are blind of at the certain stage of our career that we only recognize later. And most of the processes that kind of drive success are among those that, you know, if you're later in your career, you kind of instinctively understand, but as a young person, you're coming in, you have absolutely no clue what are, clue what are driving forces. So in that sense, I personally think that students should be exposed to that and should be exposed to not necessarily the formula, but a version that really applies to their own discipline. We actually, Dashiell and I actually wrote a book it's called Science of Science, where we're only focusing on the processes that affect academic careers and research in general. And I think that most students should be aware of that because that really drives kind of the mechanisms that defines their future career and their future success. I'm actually very pleasantly surprised to hear that business schools do train you in that. So there is always something we should learn from that. Well, I mean, there are going to be some scenarios where it is zero sum. Like you talk about how if you go for an interview, you don't want to be the first person to interview. I've seen studies that say you don't want to go right before lunch. Well, I mean, somebody has to go in that slot. I mean, we can't have everybody go last. So uh, Yes, and these are the type of things. But these are, again, processes by which how do you show your performance in the right light? And once again, it will not necessarily... Why does it matter and why does it matter? I always think that if you're really good at something, yes, you may be the first to interview here and you're not going to get that position, but you get somewhere else. And if you are, however, at the edge, then you better get the right moment to interview, right? And you better be at the right slot and so on. So in that sense, the good people eventually, typically, and again, there are always exceptions to that, right? The good people do get the right position. And we see this flocking phenomena in academia that there's always a few graduates who are so obviously good that they get offered everywhere the position, right? And that's kind of when the system comes together and it's so obvious that these persons have checked all the boxes. And I'm not never worried about those people because uh, even if somewhere they end up in the wrong slot, somewhere else they will actually get the position. But you are right on the other hand that academic life is a really low numbers game. And this is what I tell my students. The problem with academia in contrast to business is that there are relatively few positions every year opening up. And hence, you need to kind of maximize your chances that you get the right hearing. And in those situations where the numbers are very low, where understanding these laws can matter. And hence, I always tell them, okay, when are they making the decision? What dates are you offer? Are they offering you for interview? Okay, take the last one. <laughs> right. Don't be over eager and try to be the first one to make the good impression, which is what young people always want to do or often want to do. But to the contrary, be among the last one to be interviewed because if you are among the first one, you will be forgotten. Well, look, part of it is about leveraging networks, but part of it's also about picking the right network. And you referenced some studies that seem to indicate it didn't really matter as much as you might think which school you went to. But I think most of us would think that if you go to a Harvard or a Stanford, you're going to wind up being able to tap into networks that wouldn't otherwise be available to you. And you people move to Silicon Valley because precisely because they want to tap into networks that they can't get in other parts of the world. 
is there a way that we can identify when picking the right network matters? That's a very good question. And indeed, the question is, why does Harvard matter? And why does Stanford matter and these top schools matter? And they precise matter these days because we stopped trying to measure performance and we replaced it with these kind of stamps of approval by institutions. And really, I often ask the question, right, is Harvard really so good at what it does because it teaches so much better than other universities? Or is it just simply gets the best people to work with, right? And it's not any better than others. And I should disclose the fact that I do have an appointment at Harvard, right? So I'm very familiar with that system. And I still want to say that the top schools really are not so much better at providing education, which is kind of our core mission, than the other schools. But we really excel because we get such a good body of students to begin with. So then the question for you is that, are you that good student who can get into Harvard? So you get that type of uh, a stamp of approval. And this is not only about Harvard, right? This is about publishing in nature and science. This is about getting to the Biennale as an artist, the Venice Biennale. All of these places are really serve as kind of signatures of hierarchies and kind of simplify for the rest of us the process of how do we select among candidates because we assume that they have done the work for us. The problem with this is that there are lots of fabulous students or researchers or artists who didn't make it to these places, and they would be just as good for the task at hand as those who did. And once again, this is not to say that people who go to Harvard may not deserve it. They do, and they're really good. But there are lots of other people out there who are just as good as they are. So if you are in a business where the big challenge for you would be, how do you find those individuals that may have not gone to Harvard and yet they could actually provide the performance? And there's lots of academic research to show that those kids who do end up actually going to Harvard and those who don't, but they're measurable in terms of performance characteristics previous to college, they do in the long run just as well as those who actually do make it into these elite schools. So there is actually lots of hope for those people who, for whatever reason, didn't make the cut for these elite schools, that they come around and they can have just a successful life or often more successful than those who did. Now, one of the more interesting findings in the book had to do with this notion of the Q factor. And this I think it was encouraging for someone who's older (laughs) like me because attempts to kind of puncture this myth that most of the great discoveries happen in our youth. And of course, this is a big debate in Silicon Valley where the question is, would you ever fund a 50-year-old founder or is it always going to be the 19-year-old dropouts that you ought to be funding? Right, absolutely. So let's talk about what is that, right? Why are we kind of interested in this topic? We're two graying people with graying hair talking to each other, right? So it's very topical for us to understand, is there still hope for us? And when you look at the literature, the traditional claims, or at least the kind of belief is no, because creativity echoes youth. And this is, has very strong tradition, particularly in sciences. Einstein himself made a claim once that someone who doesn't make their big discovery by 30, he will never do so. And the question you would ask, why did Einstein say that? And because he looked around at the generation that he really admired and worked with, which is typically the quantum mechanics generation, most of these people made their discoveries in their 20s. And so the question is, is it really true? And we ended up putting this under the microscope by pretty much reconstructing the career of all scientists and asking the question, when did they write their highest impact paper? At what stage of their career? And the answer was very surprising. First, when you looked at it, it looked like, indeed, most of the highest impact work was published in the first 15 years of their career. So it totally confirmed the Einstein claim and everybody's claim that you have to be young. But then we have to kind of realize, wait a second, we have to control for productivity. That is that, how many papers do you publish? So if you actually don't look at the age, but you put the papers from one to end together and say, is it going to be the first or the middle or the last paper of your career is going to be the most successful? Then suddenly, 
there is no order effect. So it's not true that earlier papers are more likely to be innovative and high impact than the later papers. So what's really going on? The answer is very simple. Productivity changes with age. Creativity doesn't. Meaning that when you're young, you put lots of papers out. And what we mathematically showed is that really it's impossible to predict which of your papers will be successful. So it's like picking lottery tickets. But if you buy most of your lottery tickets before the age of 30 and you kind of get disillusions or simply slow down or you don't have any more money and you stop buying later or just fewer and fewer lottery tickets, when we look at the population, it looks like only young people win lotteries. <laughs> so the answer is that as long as you can keep up productivity, as long as you're willing to do what you're doing, there is no age effect. And I bring beautiful examples in the book. The favorite one is actually the chemistry Nobel Prize winner for in the 1990s, who has done the Nobel Prize winning research after he was forcefully retired by Yale University. And he just passed out actually a few years ago when I read his New York Times obituary saying that last week he was 93 when he passed away and the week he died, he was still in the lab and working. And now once we look from that lens, it turns out there's a huge amount of evidence that it's really productivity and not creativity that really fades with age. And people who are willing, and this requires lots of discipline, and sometimes ability, right? But those who are able to keep up productivity, they could be creative very age, very late in the age. And then let's go back to Silicon Valley. This is not in the book because that research wasn't out there, but some colleagues from Northwest University Business School, they actually looked at who does successful companies in function of age, Like, right? What is the age of the founder? Will there be an exit in the company? There's measure of success, whether there was a successful exit whether the company went public or was sold. And it turns out that I believe it's about three times more likely that you will form a successful company if you are in the 50s than if you are in the 20s or 30s. It's just that there's fewer companies founded by 50-year-olds. Yes. So what's really happening here is really an attention, like you, somebody in the 20s forms a company that is successful. That's a wonderful story, right? That we all love it. And we tend to kind of focus on that and we create urban myth on that. And we tend to ignore the many other companies who were funded by much older individuals who were in the long run just as successful as the 20 years old and so on. But when you look at the data across many, many disciplines, the jury is still very clear that creativity and age don't correlate productivity and age correlate. So then what accounts for the decline in productivity? I mean, I love this. You did some, in the Bursts book, you talked about Einstein's correspondence. And it looked like the amount of correspondence that he did kind of went up as he got older because he got more famous and so everybody's writing him. I mean, is that the kind of stuff that gets in the, I mean, apart from family and so forth? I mean, what is it that leads to this reduction in productivity? Health, family, but fame. And fame is a very interesting thing, right? Because... What fame does is it suddenly opens up opportunities for processes that they are just as valuable for the individuals and for the community, but they're no longer measured based on the previous metric. So when you decide to become a department chair or a dean, you may be contributing to science just as much as you did when you were writing papers, but it's no longer visible to us as a simple matrix of what's your impact on the scientific community. So on one end really is that, and this is kind of the curse of many successful scientists, and this is the reason why I never agreed to be on any committee or any rule or any function or any directorship, is because we end up being attracted by these opportunities. We cannot say no, and hence, fundamentally, we cannot focus on what we are really good at. So the reasons for the decline in productivity, as we just discussed, are many. And family, obviously, is a very important one, and health, and so on. And really, what is rare is this is why we see so few people kind of really breaking through at later age. It's rare for somebody to be able to keep it up. But the data shows that it's totally random in the space of your projects, which is going to be the most successful one. And I urge you, I'm sure you have inner data of how many people actually listen to your podcasts 
and look at the sequence of podcasts. And of course, account for the time because like the most recent one, I haven't had enough time to acquire the live right listenership and see whether to what degree this is really random and may not even be connected necessarily to the person you are interviewing, right? So in that sense, if your goal is to really succeed in a particular area, then there's one thing that you can help the lot that potential for success, keep doing it. And maybe we should start putting our deans and department chairs as co-authors. <laughs> right? I'm sure they would love that, right? <laughs> They'd love to. Yeah, yeah, yes, but then what, what are we doing right? <laughs> Uh, yes, and that would be, yes, it may not work. And because what we should do, however, is to find metrics that acknowledge their performance and the work that they're doing for us. Because in the moment you're willing to be the dean, you're doing lots of stuff that I don't have to do. And my favorite, always kind of what I warn people is when they accept a role to become department chair or something because they think the alternative would be worse. Well, also, it's when you help out your colleagues and not only in academia, but also in the workplace. If you're a salesperson and you're coaching other salespeople, that's typically going to come at the detriment of your measured performance as a salesperson. Absolutely. And actually, in academia, this has been even measured. There's some colleagues who ended up going and putting together who are acknowledged in the paper, who are not called to. And it turns out that there are some really super helpers that people who are really never co-authors in the papers, but if they help with the paper and they appear in the acknowledgement, the paper will have much bigger impact than those that are not there. So these are these silent helpers of science that you can actually detect using this data. And that once they're present, they are kind of acting as these invisible coaches and all the credit goes to the superstars who keep the goals. Well, of course, you got to make sure those are real helpers. And I know in law reviews, if you want to get your law review article published, you thank all sorts of famous people, <laughs> regardless of whether they helped you or not. In science, we don't have that. So that acknowledgement seems to be relatively honest in the sense that we only put people who have, you discussed the project at least, with, or they provided something. And it's remarkable that you need these kind of silent coaches in the department for people to succeed. Well, Laszlo, thanks so much for joining me. We barely really scratched the surface of your books. We didn't even talk about Transylvanian and Hungarian history, which is, I tell you, after reading Burst, it really made me want to travel there to, to see uh, that part of the world. And Come and see. It's beautiful. You will never be disappointed. It's a very different experience. I'm heading there in a week. Okay. And also lots of stuff on Poisson distributions and other kinds of mathematical patterns. Anyway, thanks so much for joining me. We'll hopefully talk again soon, and I look forward to the next book. Thank you, Brad. Appreciate it uh, for inviting me. Thank you for tuning in to the Unsiloed Podcast produced by University FM. If you enjoyed today's episode, please give us a five-star rating and review in your favorite listening app. To listen to our other episodes, please visit our website at www.unsiloedpodcast.com.